USA, circa 1830, the young slave approached the Irishman unbidden. They were unloading stones from a scow, a small vessel used for transporting cargo to and from ships lying in harbour. It was heavy work, but the boy, no more than 12 or 13 years old, was quick to help. He was a powerful youth and clearly familiar with the world of the docks. When they finished, one of the men asked the boy if he was a slave. I told him I was. He asked, are ye a slave for life? I told him that I was. The good Irishman seemed to be deeply affected by the statement. He said to the other that it was a pity so fine a little fellow as myself should be a slave for life. He said it was a shame to hold me. The Irishman told him to escape north. He would find friends there and be free. The boy feigned ignorance. White men, he wrote later, had been known to encourage slaves to escape, and then, to get the reward, catch them and return him to their masters. Nevertheless, the boy remembered the advice, resolving from that time to run away. Baltimore, on whose harbor this brief meeting took place, was one of the largest and most important cities in America, shipping grain from the Midwest and cotton from the South all over the world. It was a crush of canneries, factories, warehouses, mills and shipbuilding yards, dubbed the Monumental City by President John Quincy Adams on account of its surfeit of churches and statues. It was also the gateway to America for many thousands of European immigrants, mainly Irish and German, second only to Ellis Island in New York. The two Irishmen unloading the scow were deeply representative of the immigrant experience, escaping poverty and or persecution at home for a life of hard labor in the burgeoning metropolises of the United States. The young slave lending him a hand was Frederick Bailey, better known to the world as Frederick Douglass. Related page note for educational and research, and references purposes only, book page, note, study. Talbot County Slaves, one that stretched back to the early years of the colony. Frederick's first years were spent in a cabin by a creek on the rural eastern shore of Chesapeake Bay. He lived with his grandparents, Isaac and Betsy Bailey, and an ever-changing collection of siblings and cousins. It was a cramped and basic shelter, with windowless log walls and some planks thrown over the rafters to act as beds. Frederick's clothes were few and the food, despite his grandmother's best efforts, was often of the coarsest kind, cornmeal mush picked off a wooden tray with an oyster shell, and yet Frederick's memories of this time were positively bucolic, the many hardships leavened by the thrill of being a child in the warm countryside, running wild through the trees, rolling in the dust and plunging headfirst into the muddy waters of the Tuckahoe Creek. Frederick's father was a white man, quite possibly his owner Aaron Anthony, a farmer in his fifties who was also a state manager at the nearby plantation, Y House. His skin color, certainly, was of a far lighter hue than the rest of his family. Frederick's mother, Harriet Bailey, lived and worked on one of Anthony's farms a few miles away. Anthony owned about 30 slaves, spread over a couple of farms. He saw her rarely, for although the distance between them was not great, it was almost impossible for field hands to leave their place of work. The slave mother, Frederick wrote angrily in later years, can be spared long enough from the field to endure all the bitterness of a mother's anguish, when it adds another name to a master's ledger but not long enough to receive the joyous reward afforded by the intelligent smiles of her child. Point three, Harriet died quite young, when Frederick was six or seven years old, and the pain of never really knowing her was a source of lifelong grief. Cut off from his mother, the greatest influence on Frederick's early years was his grandmother Betsy.